Four most powerful prophecies in the book of Revelation. Destruction of Babylon. The final victory and new creation. The final chapters of Revelation describe the fall of Babylon, symbolic of evil and corrupt worldly powers, the final defeat of Satan and his followers, the last judgment, and the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth. This includes the vision of the new Jerusalem, a place where God dwells with humanity in a restored, perfect state, free from sin, suffering, and death. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, vanished, and there was no longer any sea. Revelation 21 1. This verse is a stunning and hopeful vision of the future. It is a significant moment in the book of Revelation, as it talks about a huge change in the world as we know it. Firstly, the new heaven and a new earth symbolizes a complete renewal or transformation. Revelation 21. 1. It's not just about fixing what's broken. It's about creating something entirely new and perfect. This new creation is free from the flaws and pain of our current world. The part about the first heaven and earth passing away means that the old ways in the old world, with all its problems and suffering, are gone for good. This is a big deal because it represents the end of all the negative things we experience in life, like pain, sadness, and injustice. Then there's the line, and the sea was no more. In the Bible, the sea often symbolizes chaos and danger. So saying the sea is no more is like saying that all the chaos, danger, and evil are gone. It's a picture of a world that's completely safe, peaceful, and good. This verse is full of hope and promise. It gives us a glimpse of what the world will be like when God makes everything new. A perfect place with no more pain or sorrow, where everything is just as it should be. The new heaven and new earth. The concept of a new heaven and a new earth, as mentioned in the Bible, relates both to the present reality and the future fulfillment of God's plan. Hebrews 12, 29 speaks of the heavenly Jerusalem as a current reality for believers suggesting that the new Jerusalem represents the New Testament church and the kingdom of God. It signifies the heavenly nature of communion and fellowship between God and his people, which begins through faith in his life and blossoms into the fullness of glory through the ages. Resurrection of Christ. The new creation began with the resurrection of Christ, who is seen as the first fruits of this new humanity and new creation. This process involves a transformation of the old world, a kind of shaking and recreating as described in Hebrews 12, 26. His voice shook the earth and Mount Sinai then, but now he has given a promise, saying, Yeah, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the starry heaven. In this situation, the way people used to worship in the times of Moses, along with the old ways of how societies and governments worked, are being changed and made better because of what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. This new creation is not limited to a future expectation, but is a present reality. This part talks about how the idea of a new earth, about more than just cleaning up our planet from all the evil. It's actually about a totally new kind of world that comes from what Jesus did when he died on the cross and then came back to life. This new world involves changing both in how we think and act. That's the moral and spiritual part. And in the actual physical world we live in, but this big change isn't something we can just see with our eyes. It's something we have to believe in with faith. It shows just how powerful Jesus' resurrection and sacrifice were, affecting both our inner lives and the world around us. In the New Testament, when they talk about something being new, it's usually about how good or different it is, not just about it being recent or happening at a certain time. So when it mentions a new creation, it's, it means that things are being changed or improved in their very nature, not just being replaced or updated in time. This understanding challenges us to live in the reality of this new creation now, rather than seeing it as a distant future event. It means embracing the kingdom of God that is already at work in the world and participating in its unfolding through our lives.
the new Jerusalem, therefore, is not just a future hope, but a present reality in which we can partake through the relationship with Christ. The book of Revelation, along with the prophecies Jesus shared in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, outline several key events that will happen before Christ's return. Imagine a world where these events unfold. What would it be like? A union of European nations, the Bible talks about a revived Roman Empire, a coalition of European nations. With the formation of the European Union, we're seeing a semblance of this prophecy. It's like watching history and prophecy intertwine, isn't it? In the Bible, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Revelation 17 hint at a fascinating connection with the European Union today. Think of it like this. Daniel saw visions of great empires represented by beasts and a statue, which symbolized different kingdoms throughout history. Fast forward to Revelation 17, and it talks about a union of 10 kings or leaders coming together in the end times. Now look at the current state of European countries. It's a group of countries that have joined forces just like the prophecy said would happen. It's like these ancient scriptures we're painting a picture of a power alliance in Europe, and now we're seeing something very similar. A fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. The fourth beast in Daniel's vision was so terrifying and powerful that it was impossible to describe. It had ten horns, which symbolized its immense strength and dominance. And in ancient times, horns represented the power and fierceness of an animal. And this beast was so formidable. It had ten horn. According to the interpretation that the Antichrist emerges from the fourth beast in Daniel's vision, it is speculated that there will be a revival of the Roman Empire in the end times. This revival would involve a coalition of ten world leaders, similar to the ten horns on the fourth beast. The Antichrist would rise to power within this coalition and overthrow three of the leaders to take a position of global authority. As a tyrant, the Antichrist would demand worship and seek to control all aspects of life. This interpretation suggests a scenario where the Antichrist establishes a totalitarian regime, exerting control over people's beliefs, behaviors, and daily activities. Revelation 13, 16, 17, NKJV, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name revelation 13 2 new king james version now the beast which i saw was like a leopard his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth were like the mouth of a lion the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. To put it simply, the beast in Revelation is a combination of all the features of Daniel's beast. It is similar to Daniel's fourth beast in that it speaks arrogantly and oppresses God's people for three and a half years. This highlights the common theme shared between the visions of both Daniel and Revelation. Underlining the significance of these prophecies, in comprehending future events. Revelation 13, 5, 7, Nink JG, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe tongue, and nation. It is believed that the Antichrist reign will last for 42 months only, and no more. After that, God has promised to judge the little horn, or as described by John, the beast was captured and thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The Son of Man, however, will rule forever. Daniel 7, 26. But then the court will pass judgment, and all his power will will be taken away and completely destroyed. Revelation 19. 20 Nick KJV then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, 
by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. The gospel preached worldwide, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14 today. Thanks to technology and global missions, the gospel reaches further than ever before. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Matthew 24, 14, this verse is all about spreading the good news of God's kingdom. The core message of Jesus. Isn't it amazing that despite different languages and cultures, this message has reached almost every corner of the earth. Final Witnesses Revelation speaks of two witnesses whose message will be seen worldwide, only in our time, with global media and the internet. Could this prophecy be fulfilled? It's a powerful reminder at the times we live in. These two witnesses, with their dramatic mission and miraculous powers, really highlight the extraordinary events of the end times. Their story isn't just a tale from the past. It's a dramatic part of an unfolding future. A description of the two witnesses who will assist in carrying out God's work during the tribulation can be found in Revelation 11. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And so if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. Revelation 11, 3, 5. At the beginning of the church age, John on Patmos is the prophet. At the end, there will be two witnesses who will prophesy in the city of Jerusalem. There is a sense of impending disaster in the spectacular appearance of these two mighty. Their ministry is prophetic in nature, as indicated by the fact that they prophesy, preach, and demonstrate repentance by wearing sackcloth. Their ministry is also effective as we read that they have been given power the two witnesses indeed served with power. Such power, in fact, that they can witness for one 260 days despite the world's antagonism. We also read, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. In the book of Revelation, it is mentioned that God has granted special protection to the two witnesses, who are referred to as two men in the ancient Greek grammar. These two witnesses will possess miraculous powers to accompany their message, and nobody will be able to hinder their mission. Revelation 11, 6, these have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesy, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. But they will be killed when their testimony is concluded the wicked world will rejoice, allowing the bodies of the fallen prophets to lie in the streets. Revelation 11, 7, 10, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie on the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days, will not allow their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb, and those who live on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who lived on earth. The term as Sodom speaks of immorality, and the term as Egypt speaks of oppression and slavery. The earth saw and triumphed over the deaths of the two witnesses. Their bodies will lie in the streets for just over three days, while the transnational mass, tormented in conscience by their expressions, gloat over and celebrate the removal. When the two are resurrected in full view of everyone, the relief will turn to terror. Their ascension will be triggered by a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. Revelation 11 11 through 12. 
And after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. Because the earth was unworthy of these two witnesses, God simply summoned them, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. It is evident that people often fail to heed the message of God's prophets. An earthquake can bring about judgment and inspire praise towards God. However, it remains to be seen whether this will lead to genuine repentance and salvation once individuals depart the city. It's apparent that a powerful earthquake will have already destroyed one-tenth of the buildings and taken the lives of seven zero inhabitants. The similarities between the deaths of the two witnesses and Jesus cannot be overlooked. It is impossible not to contemplate the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Of course, there are differences. In his case, the earthquake coincided with his death, and the general public witnessed neither his resurrection after three days nor his ascension. It will result in fear of and glory to God. Matthew 27, 51, Amplified Bible, and at once the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split apart. There are three primary theories on the identity of the two witnesses in Revelation. Many people believe that Moses and Elijah could be the two witnesses because John makes specific references to the miracles that the witnesses would accomplish. Moses witnesses more miracles than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob combined. Several miracles occurred. One after another as God interceded on behalf of his people. The witnesses will have the power to convert water into blood, replicating one of Moses' most famous miracles. Additionally, they will have the power to destroy their enemies with fire, which corresponds to an event in Elijah's and Moses. Numbers 16.35 Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Also giving strength to this view is that Moses and Elijah both appeared with Jesus at the Transfiguration. Some believe Elijah is one of the witnesses because his ministry appears similar to these two witnesses. According to Jewish tradition, the return of Moses and Elijah is anticipated. This belief is based on the prediction of Elijah's coming mentioned in Malachi 4, 5, as well as God's promise to raise a prophet like Moses. Some Jews interpret this promise as requiring the return of Moses. Deuteronomy 18, 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. To him you shall listen. Malachi 4 5. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord Enoch and Elijah. Enoch and Elijah are often regarded as potential candidates for the roles of the two witnesses due to the extraordinary events surrounding their deaths. As far as we know, God has only directly taken two people to heaven without them having to go through the process of dying. The passage in Hebrews 9, 27, which states that it is destined for all men to die once, is cited by supporters of this perspective. It would appear that the fact that Enoch and Elijah have not yet been put to death qualifies them for the role of the two witnesses, who will both be put to death once they have completed their respective tasks. Some people believe that the two witnesses mentioned in the Bible are Enoch and Elijah. This is because neither Enoch nor, nor Elijah died a natural death, but were carried to heaven. Hebrews 9. 27 states that it is appointed for men to die once. So those who believe that the two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah reason that they must return to earth to die there. Since it is set for men to die, once this interpretation of Hebrews 927 is incorrect since this outlines a principle rather than an absolute and unchangeable law. For example, Lazarus and others were raised from the dead and apparently died twice. Yet this does not disprove Hebrews 9, 
27. At the time of the rapture, the entire church on earth will not die, but be carried to heaven. Hebrews 9, 27 is a principle, and there are a few notable exceptions that ultimately serve to prove, rather than deny the rule. There may be good reasons to regard Enoch and Elijah as the two witnesses, but the principle of Hebrews 9, 27 is not one of them. In addition, both Enoch and Elijah were prophets who pronounced God's judgment. It is possible for God to empower any two ordinary believers to achieve the same signs and wonders as Moses and Elijah did. Revelation 11 does not suggest that the two witnesses must be famous individuals. We currently do not have any information about the identity of the two witnesses. All attempts to identify them are mere speculation. Therefore, we must wait and see who they are. Nevertheless, it is important to note that their actions and what happens to them are significant. Before concluding this section, two predictions must be highlighted. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather in your presence, humbled and amazed by the mysteries and the majesty of your word, especially as revealed in the book of Revelation. As we reflect on the profound prophecies within its pages, our hearts are stirred and our minds seek understanding. We ask for your guidance and wisdom to understand these revelations and to apply them in our lives and the world around us. Help us, you Lord, to embody the faithfulness of Smyrna, the repents of Ephesus, the courage of Pergamum, the love of Thyatira, the purity of Sardis, the steadfastness of Philadelphia, and the zeal of Laodicea. May our lives be a reflection of your love and grace, and may we be lights in this world, guiding others to your truth. In the vision of the seven seals, we see a world afflicted by trials and tribulations. Heavenly Father, in these times of uncertainty and strife, grant us the strength to persevere. Help us to be peacemakers, to bring hope to the hopeless and comfort to the suffering. Teach us to trust in your divine plan, knowing that even in the midst of trouble, your love and justice prevail. As we consider the prophecy of the seven trumpets, our hearts are moved by the reminders of your call to repentance and redemption. Lord, let these trumpets not be sounds of fear for us, but calls to action. Instill in us a spirit of humility and a desire for transformation. Guide us to live in a manner worthy of your calling, turning away from sin and embracing the life of righteousness and love. In the final prophecy of the New Jerusalem, we find a vision of hope and eternal joy. Father, this promise of a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more tears or pain fills our hearts with longing. Help us to keep this vision in our minds as we navigate the challenges of this world. May it inspire us to work towards a world that reflects your love, justice, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for those who have yet to know you. May the messages of Revelation open their hearts to your love and salvation. Give us the courage and the words to share your gospel, to be witnesses of your grace and mercy. We pray for our leaders and those in authority, that they may be guided by your wisdom and righteousness. May their decisions bring about peace, justice, and healing in a world so often marked by conflict, injustice, and suffering. Father, we ask for your protection and guidance in our personal lives. Help us to discern your will in all things to respond with faith and obedience. In moments of doubt or fear, remind us of your eternal presence and unwavering love as we face the challenges and uncertainties of life. Help us to remember the lessons of revelation. Teach us to live with an eternal perspective, valuing what is truly important and letting go of what is temporary. In the midst of life's trials, may we find comfort in the promise of your eternal kingdom. Let the hope of New Jerusalem sustain us, the vision of streets of gold, the river of life, and the tree of life. Where there will be no more night, and you will be our everlasting light. Lord, we ask for the grace to live out the message of revelation in our daily lives. 
may we be vigilant and faithful ever ready for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ until that day. Let us be diligent in our service, fervent in our love, and unwavering in our faith. In all things we give thanks and praise for you. Our God and your love and yours forever.